but also can be uh, plagued by falling out, is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to check the contralateral side too. And by checking the contralateral side, we can actually go through a test phase and make sure that both are working. Once you find you're in one foramen, usually everything else kind of falls into place. So I'm going to let the patient know there's going to be a, another poke for the anesthetic. While he's doing uh, the numbing, I'd like to invite any more questions. Uh, we do have another one about the fact is alcohol or medication affect the device. The key here is uh, alcohol does have an effect on bladder function as well as there are many medications. So here again, it's important to talk to your urologist and give them that information if you drink uh, a monitor to a, a, a severe amount of alcohol or if you're on any medications. It's important to give that kind of history to your physician so he can make, make the best choices for your therapy. Right now we're flooring again and we're seeing he's trying to get into the foramen like we talked about before. He's trying to find that most middle upper part of that S3 foramen to get the best signal. The key here it, it is a fairly large foramen. You want to get it most close to the nerve so he uses the least amount of energy to get the best stimulation. While we're waiting here we can talk a little about we have actually the test box. This is the box the patient goes home with. There's the lead uh, that comes off, uh, the, the temporary lead, the plug right into this box, and there's a little control here that the patient can actually adjust the amount of stimulation. So you'll be advised before you leave on a setting, and then you can go through the day, and we use actually a log book so you can actually tell us how your symptoms are improving. That's very important for the doctor to be able to determine if it's a good therapy for you or not. The amount of time we wait can even be for a couple days to a week to see what kind of response you'll get. And then if that does work well, then we can start talking about the possibility of having a permanent implant. Now when they do do the permanent implant, we do have this lead. This is the temporary lead, is this lead right here, is very fine, and it just comes out through the skin. This other lead actually is implanted, which is a little thicker, but it's actually blended below the skin, so you will not see this. It's actually internally implanted. It has these little tines here that prevent it from migrating, which is important which allows you to be active so the actual therapy will continue to work. When they do finally do put the permanent one in, we have this temporary brain. You can see the difference. This is the one on the outside. This is the one the doctor would implant. It's very small, and it uh, has the ability to last anywhere from five to 10 years as far as battery life. And there's actually a programmer that you actually can use, sort of like a remote on your TV. You don't actually have to connect to it. It'll actually send a signal to it, and that'll be able to make you adjust it and adjust as you need to and get the best results. I'll send it back to Dr. Odorica where he's actually placing the needle. And what I'm trying to do is place this in the patient's right side. I'm going to take a moment here and I'm going to change my fluoro image. We're going to go ahead to an AP view to make sure that in terms of my positioning, as far as medial or lateral, that I'm where I want to be. One of the questions we get often is, is what is the safety? Because we've already talked about that this can be very effective for urgency, frequency, or urinary retention, but what's the safety issues? And many patients ask that all the time. In the many thousands and thousands of, of implants that have done over the last 10 years, there has never been a major complication secondary to any kind of nerve damage or, or any kind of long-term damage. There is a small risk because of an implant of infection and sometimes they have to remove, and even that is a very rare complication. The key here is that we do it in the operating room where it's the most sterile. We use the fluoroscopy and we use some type of stimulating the device to get the best results and therefore get the best outcome for the patient. Here again, he's using fluoroscopy here, trying to find the exact spot. Sometimes it can be difficult, depending if the patient's had any type of scar tissue over, over time, it can cause it made difficult to get into the actual foramen. Well, I'm actually happy with how medial or lateral that, that position is. I'm gonna go back to my lateral view.
We do have a question from one patient about a, who had a radical prostatectomy. Does this help with uh, leakage? Uh, not necessarily. It depends what the leakage is from. If you have overactive bladder or urge leakage, possibly could help there. If you have what we call stress leakage, where there's damage to the sphincter, that is a different type of problem, and you most likely would require some type of, of surgical procedure, uh, which would include a sphincter or what they call a, a male sling. Here again, you can talk to your urologist about those options. Here, uh, one question about is it done under uh, sedation or uh, general anesthesia? Uh, like I said earlier, it can be done, the test can be done under total local, and actually the procedure, the permanent can be done under total local, but it's a little nicer to have a little sedation, it just makes the patient more comfortable. It is considered a minor procedure, it's not considered a major procedure, and most patients do not require general anesthesia. Go ahead. Okay. I was able to find the foramen on the right side, the S3 foramen. Let's have a quick view in terms of the x-ray image. On the x-ray image, you can see two of these needles that are actually crisscrossing. One is on the left side, the other one is actually on the right side. The tip is just beyond what we consider the ventral portion of the sacrum. So it really just is at the very margin of where the nerve enters into the pelvic space. Having placed the needle now, I'm going to go ahead and I will stimulate using uh, the compound muscle action potential to identify if there's any response. And what we're finding um, is the actual amount of stimulus that it's taking for the patient's right side is four times more than what we required on the patient's left side. We are getting very minimal toe, and we're actually getting some rotation of his leg. So if you look at his heel, we have the camera image of his heel, we can actually see the, the heel tilting inward as the leg rotates. What that's telling me is I'm getting an undesirable effect in terms of the amount of stimulation. So we're going to go ahead and we'll lower the stimulus now. What it's also telling me is that that foramen, the right S3 foramen, is not going to be terribly helpful. Now we're all wired a little bit different, but there's um, to try to stimulate through that right, right S3 foramen we would get an undesirable response in terms of leg motion, and more importantly, probably a lack of efficacy on that side. So in terms of looking at left versus right, clearly my first stimulus was helpful. And this may give us some glimpse as far as the pathology here as in terms of this particular patient, which in his case, he's having issues both with urinary retention and he's also having issues with urgency, frequency, and urge incontinence, indications for using the inner stem. <coughs> okay. What I'm going to do is just move the needle a little bit. I'm going to apply it, the stimulus <coughs> excuse me, once again. And Chris, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and put it around two, two and a half. Okay. Now what I did is I went ahead and I just uh, introduced it a little bit more and I'm starting to get an actual response. Okay, let's turn that down, Chris. Okay. So I'm starting to pick up the nerve. Yeah. But if anything, the depth of my needle is a little bit further than what I like to see. So if I had to choose between my left or my right based on this, I'm going to go with the left. I think this illustrates one of the benefits in terms of the compound muscle action potential. It's very sensitive in terms of movement of the needle, and it gives me a very good physiologic picture in terms of what's going on. Okay. Well, 
I really have two choices at this point. I can go ahead and I can place simply the left wire into that S3 foramen. I can introduce a wire into the right, or I can see whether or not I can also get a response into the S4 on that side. Because in truth, we can go ahead and get benefit not just with the S3 foramen, but also on the S4 foramen. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to numb, up, numb them up a little bit on that side. While he's numbing up the patient, we can talk a little bit. We had another question uh, about stress incontinence. There's some, some patients who have ridden in who've had some type of sling procedure or, or procedures for stress incontinence. We have to differentiate between uh, overactive bladder or urge incontinence or frequency and, and, and stress incontinence. Stress incontinence is more of an anatomical problem. There are patients that have both types, uh, the stress and mixed. This is purely for patients with some component of urge. Patients who have stress incontinence need to see the urologist and be evaluated for some type of surgical procedure or some type of other procedure, or some patients can actually use Kegels to strengthen the muscles. Those are ways to effectively uh, treat stress incontinence. This is not for that type of pure stress incontinence. Additionally, we have some other questions here. Like I said, once you've had the implant done, the test implant done, we are going to have this box here. You're able to actually change the stimulation to see what kind of best response you get. You will keep a log book to document how much you're voiding, when you're voiding, and, and uh, then come back to your urologist where he will look at the log book and determine if you're a candidate. Once they do determine your candidate, they will actually put in this permanent lead, which will be below the skin. This brings over to an actual little brain here. This brain actually has a remote control that you're able to control it, uh, adjust it up and down. There are several programs on this so that your urologist can actually um, change the settings on the, on the actual implant, determine to get you your best results. Here, Dr. Uh, Odorica is trying to get into the S4 foramen. He'll be using both the fluoroscopy right now. As he it passes, you can see on the fluoroscopy, it's going down along the foramen, just below. He likes to get it just below the level of the bone so he can get the best stimulation. The nerves run just below that. It's often asked, how does interstim work? And interestingly, it seems to work more like a filter. Often we believe that the bladder actually gets mixed signals as you get older or if you had some kind of trauma or procedure, or, uh, and that causes the bladder actually kind of misfire. So it's sort of like a static information is coming in. The interstim actually acts like a filter and gets rid of that bad information so the good information can control the bladder and give you the best, give you some type of improved results. So that's our understanding of how interstim actually interacts with the bladder. The battery will be on these actually last uh, five to seven years. So typically most patients uh, uh, won't have to have any type of change, but they do have to have a change. Uh, it's done by opening, opening the small incision where the battery is actually placed. We didn't really talk about where the battery is placed, but it's actually placed right uh, on the side of your, of your buttocks below the fat. Um, and it's difficult to tell or feel it, uh, but you know the proximal position and then that's how you adjust it. But none of this is on the outside. These are all implants. There are some questions about if the uh, interstim does not work, uh, what are my options? Well, it really depends on, on a lot of factors. Often we may add medications uh, and use combination medical therapy as well as interstim therapy to get the best results. Some patients have such severe uh, urge and frequency or retention, they may have some alternative therapy needed. And here again, this is where you work very closely with the urologist to get the best results and see what his plan is. So my biggest recommendation, if you do have symptoms of frequency, urgency, uh, or retention, if you're taking medical management, it's not working effectively for you anymore, uh, I would make an appointment with your local urologist and see if he can evaluate you. Uh, this is what we do, this is our specialty, and, and therefore see if you can get somebody who can help you and, and, and get the best improvement of your quality of life. Here, Dr. Odorica is trying to get, uh, place the needle. If you go to the fluoroscopy, you can actually see him passing the needle uh, just below those other two needles. It's entering the foramen. Here, he'll try to get it just below the surface of the bone so he can stimulate just that nerve, which runs, runs right in that area right below the foramen. 
This is a very safe procedure. There are no major uh, uh, structures that can be damaged as he passes the needle. What he'll try to do is get in that inner corner to get the best results uh, of, of our stimulation.